Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm Charles Hunter, teaching to you from the City of Light School of Ministry, the most exciting school in the world, and the video schools that are going around the world. How we praise God for every one of you in video schools, plus all of you that are right here at the City of Light School. Hallelujah. We're going to be skipping around a little bit and teaching in the book, How to Heal the Sick. This is a series on how to heal the sick, and we're not going to necessarily go in the same order of the chapters, but we'll get all of them before we get through. We're going to deal with chapter 9, Anointing with Oil. Chapter 9, Anointing with oil, uh, the first session. Hallelujah. Anointing with oil. Let me give you the scripture, the very first thing on which uh, this chapter is based. That's on the third page over. It's on page 105. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, uh, you've heard Francis and me say, uh, uh, Jesus didn't pray for the sick. He didn't. So far as the Bible records, Jesus never one time prayed for the sick. He healed them, or he cast out devils, and they were well. He didn't pray for them. And so why would this be that you can come in here and say, uh, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, you know, not with all and pray. Why do we say that? Uh, this began to get on my mind one time, and so I began to ask God, uh, really, why was this? So let me, let me teach you something that God showed me, and I think that you'll, you'll see very clearly. Hallelujah. I might say in the beginning, if you're in a charismatic, Pentecostal, Holy Ghost-filled church, and they anoint with oil, praise God for it. Participate if they want you to. But wait until you get through the end of this session, I think you'll understand the procedure, the reason for this particular scripture. When uh, Francis and I were first married, uh, we did not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We were ministering uh, to people, praying for them, laying hands on them, believing the scriptures that would work. And uh, as we've said, maybe 10 out of 10,000 did. But in the early part of our ministry, our, our married life, uh, I was operating as the president of my CPA firm. I was busy, very heavy tax season when we were married the first of the year. Francis already had her schedule for the whole year out in speaking engagements. She was an evangelist. And so I would uh, go out on weekends, and once in a while I'd get to go out during the week and go to these services. Now, Francis, uh, the Spirit of God had fallen on her in her own denomination until over 3,000 people stampeded out of a meeting one time and almost walked over each other trying to get to the altar. The Spirit of God fell so strongly. Well, that splashed her name around the world in her denomination and my denomination, the same one, uh, even though we hadn't known each other before. Now, with, with that situation, Francis was on great demand as a speaker in that denomination and then began to spread out in other denominations in the evangelical, non-spiritual Felt world. And uh, she, people would just almost uh, do anything to get her to come to speak. And then comes tagging along her little old husband that's a new one. And uh, situations came that weren't real nice. Uh, no intention of the people to not be nice, but it was so bad that they wanted Francis so much that when I would walk into a building and, and uh, she'd introduce me to the pastor, he'd say, uh, uh, I know, uh, she'd say, this is my husband, Charles Hunter. And they'd say, I know, Miss Gardner, but that's it. I want you up here. And they kept calling her by the name. And, and so this was a little problem. I wanted it to be my wife, you see, not somebody that hadn't married me yet. And so it was kind of rough. And they, they'd take her off and uh, leave me sitting back there like a little puppy dog that was wounded with my tail wagon, you see. And so uh, that situation. Well, one one time it was so bad, uh, again, it was no reflection on the people. They just loved Francis. It's almost like uh, proper idol worship, if you could say it that way. They just loved her. They wanted to hear her. She could turn churches upside down every time she spoke. And so we went into this one church, about 400 people, and uh, we were introduced to the pastor. He didn't know anything about me. He didn't know anything good or bad or anything else. And so Francis said, uh, uh, let's go on up on the stage, you know, for the, on the roster for the church. And he said, I don't want him up there. And uh, Francis said, uh, in great love, she said, well, if he doesn't go up, I don't go up because we're one. And the pastor got so mad that he sat down on the back seat. I mean, he was really pouting about it. He was mad. And so Francis and I went on up. We conducted the whole service of miracle power, uh, salvation power of God. Let me put it that way. It hit so heavy that probably over a third of his congregation got saved. <laughs> he never cracked a smile. He said back there, all the power of God, the fantastic ministry. Well, I share that 
to tell you how to anoint with oil. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, that'll get your curiosity up. Okay, so uh, this particular night, uh, not that night, but another night, uh, we were in a church in Alexandria, Indiana that was uh, right next to the hometown of the church headquarters and the church we were a member of uh, at that time, the non, non-spirit-filled church. And uh, so... Francis had spoken that morning. It was a beautiful meeting. The Spirit of God moved mightily. And uh, I got up to give my usual two or three minute testimony. I'd had some tremendous experiences. I've shared those before, going to heaven and a lot of other things that uh, they got it done for me. And I usually shared that in two or three minutes. And I'd sit down and Francis would take her service because she was one called to minister. Well, this particular night I got up, I had meditated in the uh, the Bible far more than 2,000 hours. And I would trace things through like, uh, what does gold mean in the Bible? If you want to make a study, gold is a beautiful subject to study in the Bible. And I had done that. And the Spirit of God fell on me so mightily as I stood up to give that testimony. I started talking this other way. And it just started rolling out and rolling out and rolling out. It was almost like I could hear somebody else doing the talking. Uh, It was just flowing. And that's, that's often referred to as prophetic preaching. It just flowed out and flowed out. I went beyond my three minutes. In fact, it seemed like I was going beyond an hour. And it kept going. So strong was the anointing that there were about four rows of little kids, six to eight years old, right in front of me. And they sat there spellbound for over a solid hour. They didn't budge. You know it has to be God when that happens. Well, uh, because I was was aware that uh, the people didn't have a good attitude toward me if I took Francis' time, uh, all of a sudden, I just took a deep breath and I said, I've got to shut up. You called Francis. I'm sorry. And I backed off and Francis came to the podium. And she said, Jesus told me that the anointing is on Charles tonight and I'm not to speak. And so she just moved back. Now, the story that she told me later of the detail of how this happened was like this. I was standing at a podium that had two little uh, bench-like extensions out on which you could put your Bibles or whatever. And uh, on the left side of this podium, there was a bottle of olive oil that the church used for anointing with oil and healing the sick, praying for the sick. And uh, I was aware of that. Uh, Francis was sitting over in one of the two pulpit chairs over to my left. Uh, She was sitting in the one nearest to me. The pastor had chosen to sit on the front pew with his wife that night. And so he was sitting down there. The other chair was empty. And Francis was utterly amazed as for the first time she had seen the anointing of the Spirit of God fall upon her husband. She had not heard me speak in that manner, nor had I. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was supernatural. And uh, it, uh, as this was happening, uh, she was wearing a dress with a sheer sleeve, and she felt a little breeze go by. And she figured, whoops, the pastor is coming up here to sit down to tell me to tell Charles to shut up. And she didn't want to do that because she saw that God moving. But she ignored that until a few moments later, uh, on her sleeve came a strong tug. And she knew that pastor was fed up with that and he was going to run me off real fast. So she turned and she saw the pastor still sitting there out of the corner of eye and when she turned, sitting in the chair next to her with his arms on the armrest of the chair, his legs crossed, sat the Lord Jesus Christ. She said it's the most awesome thing she'd ever seen. He had a uh, a very soft but brilliant blue glow around him. He was transparent, but she said it was just glory. She said she could hardly take her eyes off of him. And Jesus pointed to the bottle of olive oil, and he said, that is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And he raised his finger up toward me, and he said, that's the real anointing. And he vanished just like that. Now, when Jesus comes to appear to a person whether it be a vision or whether it be reality, I don't know. But it's good enough for me that Jesus was there. Hallelujah. Jesus is in us. We don't have to have the vision, but it sure is good when that happens. I wish I could see him like Francis did. But I begin to think about that. Why, if Jesus said this uh, olive oil is symbolic, and I knew that, it's always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Uh, any anointing you see in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament as well as in you, it's, uh, it's symbolic of the power of the Holy Spirit. Saul poured, uh, uh, Samuel poured a flask of oil over King Saul to anoint him to be king. That was as though the Holy Spirit was coming over Saul to make him uh, led by the Spirit of God. Now, when Jesus said that, I began to think, well, Jesus, why is it that back in James, you tell the people that was long after the day of Pentecost, uh, you're still telling them 
to anoint with oil and pray for the sick to be healed. And I said, you didn't do that, so why would you put that in after the day of Pentecost? And then I discovered before the day of Pentecost, Jesus had sent the disciples out two by two and told them to go out and uh, cast out devils and heal the sick and preach the gospel. And they did, and they came back very excited about it because it worked. And so we see... Uh, we see a situation before the day of Pentecost where they were healing. And I, uh, I thought about that. I had read that I was constantly sweeping through the New Testament. And one day I was listening to Frances on a cassette tape as she had read the Living Bible. And I heard something that I had overlooked perhaps a thousand times. And it said, and they took their oil with them. You see, before the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they took their oil with them when they went out to do this healing. Now, I continued to say, well, uh, Jesus, what does that mean? If they did it before, they did it after, and yet we know that it's the power of the Holy Spirit flowing from within us that heals. We know that that's the only power. You, Jesus, said that it's only by the power of God that these miracles can happen. So we know it's the Holy Spirit power that heals. So why would we take the genuine Holy Spirit and move backwards and go back to simply something symbolic? And one day God answered me that beautiful question that was so, so beautiful the way he answered me. God said, I love all the born-again believers equally, whether or not they have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whether they don't speak in tongues or whether they do. I still love them equally. And he said, uh, he reminded me of the scripture, just flashed my mind, uh, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. And if you're a Christian, your soul should be prosperous. Therefore, uh, God wants you to be healthy. And he said, I have a desire that every one of my children be healthy. And whether or not they have the power to heal, I want them to be able to get healing. And so the ones who do not have the power, I allow them to go to the symbolic power of the Holy Spirit, and they anoint with oil, symbolic of my spirit, and they pray and they ask me to do it. You'll notice that it says there in James, and they will pray, and then the healing will come. Now, Paul prayed before, and then he healed them. Jesus healed the sick. And so what really takes place with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we, the human beings, the body of Christ, we do the healing by releasing the power of God into a body. That's the Holy Spirit power. But if we don't have the power in us, we ask God to do it. Have you ever heard of somebody saying, you put the monkey back on my shoulders? Jesus came down to earth. He lived for 33 years. His last three years or so, he was, uh, uh, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was endued with this supernatural power, and he utilized that power for miracles. Jesus healed the sick, and he cast out devils. But when he left, he sent the Holy Spirit back. When the Holy Spirit came back on the disciples, then he said, now you, and that includes us, you go use my authority and cast out the devils. He said, also, you have the power of the Holy Spirit with which to do it. You have the tools to accompany this. So you human beings that are believers, you go out and do these things. I assign you that responsibility. You are my agents. You go heal the sick. And we say, now to Jesus, you heal them. See, when we first started ministering and healing, I'd, uh, I'd simply say, oh, Jesus, heal this person. Heal them, Jesus. And I could just hear Jesus now, ah, oh, Charles, I told you to do it. You see, we put it back on the shoulders of Jesus. Well, that, what God showed me was that if you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues, the power of God fills your whole spirit, uh, then that Spirit of God coming out of you will heal the sick. But if you don't have the baptism, then God is perfectly uh, lined it up in James, the fifth chapter, so that you can symbolically apply the Holy Spirit instead of you healing them. You say, now, God, I ask you to heal them. I ask it in the name of Jesus and ask you to do the healing because they don't have the power to heal. You see, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that heals. Now, so does that make it sensible? Does that make it clear? Really, why, why we can use it. Now, if you have the baptism, it doesn't hurt a thing. The power will go right through oil. Splat. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Now, some people, there may be other reasons that they feel they should do it. For example, a point of contact. If you came to me and you said, Charles, uh, I believe if you'll anoint me with oil and pray, I'll be healed. I just know that I've expected that. The minute that oil hits my head, I'm going to be healed. Give me the oil. I'll lay hands right on it, anoint him with oil. 
I won't pray, I'll just command, <laughs> hallelujah, and they'll be healed, you see, because they have that point of contact for that healing. And so it's all right, and there may be other reasons that you as a pastor or you as a layman, you may have another reason to use oil symbolically. But in my opinion, from what God showed me, even to the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ and a vision to Francis, I don't think you need to go back of the real Holy Spirit. Give God all the glory and don't take any glory for whatever you do, even to the point of lifting your finger to no oil. Just let the power go in them. Now, one time, this is Francis' favorite story, I think, or at least one of her 10,000 favorite stories. Uh, but uh, there were a group of non-spirit-filled ladies having a Bible study one morning and they ran across this scripture in James and they thought, well, let's try it. They had a friend, and I'll call her Polly. I don't know what her name was. So Polly was dying of cancer. And they said, let's go do what it said. And so they got in their car. They went over to the church. And the pastor wasn't there. The pastor's wife wasn't there. Nobody was there. And so they didn't have any elders around. And they thought, you see, we say use common sense to, to think through situations, but let the Spirit guide you into this when you're de dealing in healing. And they thought, well, we're the oldest one here. That must make us the elders, so let's go do it. Hallelujah. So these ladies went down to the grocery store and they bought a bottle of, a uh, whole gallon of oil. Hallelujah. And they went over to see Polly. And when they got there, they poured that whole gallon all over Polly. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know whether it was Polly unsaturated oil, but Polly was saturated. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. So they poured this oil on there. They prayed, and guess what happened? Polly got healed. Hallelujah. So God can do it any way he wants to. You see the significance of the beauty of the Holy Spirit? God cannot help but get all the glory if all you have to do is become a light switch, put your hand on somebody or command a healing. Uh, it's so effortless to heal the sick. It's so easy to heal the sick. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.